Welcome to our online live stream. We're so glad that you're joining us today and being part of our online community at Christ the Rock. My name's Nancy and I'm on staff here at the church and I just want to welcome you and say that if you are someone who wants to study during the week with a group or just by yourself, we have a study guide for this message on our website at christtherock.org messages. And if you're someone who would like to be with people again in the church building, but you need or you want a 100% masked environment, we have that for you now. Um, in our second story in our lobby, there's a room called The Loft, and there you can be with people and worship together, uh, but have a 100% masked experience. So we hope we'll see you at 8.45 or 10.45 sometime for that. Um, there's a great service for you. If you've been watching, you know the first two of this series were just so moving and impactful, and um, today is no exception. So we can't wait to worship together and just hear from God's Word. Thanks for being with us today. Good morning, Christ the Rock. We are so glad that you are here, whether in the building or online. Would you stand and join us as we sing to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the one who brings us from death to life. I saw Satan fall like lightning I saw darkness run for cover But the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven I believe in signs and wonders I have resurrection power the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven My praise belongs to you forever This is my testimony from death to life This grace rewrote my story I'll testify By Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified this is my testimony, this is my testimony, yeah. Come together. Come together, sons and daughters, bought with blood and washed in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father, our God. We'll finish what he started Our God will finish what he started This is my testimony From death to life Cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify By Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified This is my testimony This is my testimony this out this morning if I'm not dead you're not done greater things are still to come oh I believe if I'm not dead you're not done greater things are still to come oh I believe if I'm not dead you're not done greater things are still to come Oh, I believe if I'm not dead, you're not dying. Greater things still to come. Oh, I believe. I'll sing us out my testimony. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. From death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify. By Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony.
Amen, amen. Let's continue on in our praise this morning. We're going to sing about the joy of the Lord in this place again. Let's lift him up, church. Of the goodness 
about the goodness of God with every breath that I'm able, about our testimony from death to life, and there's joy in the house of the Lord, and we shout out his praise. You know, you think of it in Genesis 2-7, it talks about how God picked up that clump of clay and that dust, took it in his hand, and he breathed into it, and his breath caused life, caused every one of us to be alive today. That is just... How many of you agree that's just phenomenal? How, yeah, let's give God a hand. It's just amazing what, how we, the intricate parts of the body and just everything that is, is done because of Him. And in this next song that we're going to sing, the chorus says, um, 
It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. So it's his breath. Every person in this room and that is watching online, God breathed life into you. And today, no matter what story you have, we all have stories. God is there and you are worthy. You are his, you belong to him. He's no respecter of persons. He loves each and every person the same. Look at your neighbor and just say, God loves you. God loves you. <laughs> and I think of this series, Come Together. And tonight, we're gonna be cheering on the Packers. Some of us will be, if we're Packer fans. So in this next song, can we cheer for God? Can we sing out His praise? Let's give Him all the glory today, amen, hallelujah.
Everybody said, amen. You may be seated. What an amazing time of worship. Thank you for worshiping with us. Thank you, worship team. Yes, amen. At this time, I want to let the Club 5-6 students know that they can take off for their time together. And if you're not familiar with what Club 5-6 is, this is a ministry we have here. We have, as you know, we have ministry for children, infants, all the way up through senior citizens. And one of the ways that we want to help grow and disciple our 5th and 6th grade students is to have them in here together with us for worship, for them to worship with their families, for them to experience what you just experienced here in the room and at home to be able to worship, to give our God praise and honor. And then to have a time that they can be dismissed and go to a class time where they can connect with each other, where they can grow and be discipled in an environment that, that helps them at their age. And so uh, we're just grateful for that ministry. Speaking of connection, uh, if you're here with us in the building and you would like to find out more about how you can get connected to the body of Christ, get connected here at Christ the Rock, we want to invite you to go to the link. The link is a room right outside the doors. Uh, you can see a picture up on the screen and location there. We have some link hosts that are there to help serve you, to help you get connected, to help you know what your next step might be. And so I encourage you after service, whether you, this is your first time here or your first time in a long time or you've been here for a long time and you just want to know how can I I grow in my relationship with Jesus? How can I get connected here to Christ the Rock? I encourage you to go check out the link on your way out. And for those of you online, thank you for joining us. We also want to let you know of an opportunity you have to connect with us. And so if you would go to ChristTheRock.org forward slash connect, you can find out some ways that you can get connected to the body here, ministries we have, programs we have, or any way that we might be able to help you, go to that link. Or if you're live right now in the chat, just type in the word connect, and we can connect with you there with some of our hosts that are online. So thank you for doing that. Well, in just a moment, we're going to continue in the third week in our Come Together series, and Pastor Ben is going to share with us a challenging message as we've been going through this series. Uh, I hope that your heart has been opened and challenged, and that you've been listening uh, to what the Holy Spirit's been telling you in this. Uh, because it is so difficult for those of us, uh, often even in the midst of saying we're Christ followers, to overcome differences with each other and with the world. And this morning we're going to talk about overcoming differences within your family. And so we're going to do that in just a moment. But before we do that, we talked a little bit about Club 5-6, and we know we have children's ministry. But we have ministries here that help serve uh, all ages. And I want you to turn your attention to the screen and hear about an important ministry that we don't talk a lot about here, but you need to hear about this ministry, Shepherd's Care. Let's turn our attention to the screens. Uh, Shepherd's Care Community Outreach exists to bring the love and hope of Jesus to those that reside in care communities and senior retirement communities throughout the Fox Valley. We currently serve in about 22 care communities sprinkled throughout the Fox Valley, and we have about 45 team members that participate with us in that ministry. Um, yes, it is such a joy just to uh, build relationship with these dear people. They have so much wisdom and they have so much love to give us. And yet, you know, many times they are isolated. Family is, is too busy to visit. Uh, you know, they're dealing with a chronic, you know, issue and of pain. And they, they just are so responsive and so open to experiencing the love of Christ through our visits, through our one-on-one uh, -on -one time with them, through church services. 
we are blessed just as much as, as the residents are in, in what we do and our, our presence there. Um, we try to bring encouragement, joy, hope to them, um, show them dignity. Oftentimes, kind of um, a side effect from um, ministering to these residents and care communities is that the staff or even family members are nearby. They're in earshot and they hear and they see what we're doing and so we don't even realize that they're taking that all in. And there have been times when not only have residents asked me to pray about something in their life, but I've had staff members from the care community approach me and say, hey, would you please pray about this for me? And then I've also had an opportunity to invite them to church. It's amazing because this is a mission field. You know, a mission field um, that is right in our backyard that we don't need to get on a plane to go to. We don't need to fundraise to do it. We can just drive across town and there are hearts that are open and we're just seeing such eagerness and such joy and such reception. Even residents with uh, profound or advanced dementia will know all of the words to a hymn and it'll come alive because that dementia has not affected their spirit and it's in their heart and you're reawakening their joy in the Lord that they might have forgotten. Just going into the care communities and sometimes feeling a bit like um, I'm not sure what I'm going to say or how it's going to go, but it requires me to rely on God and to pray a lot and to look for Him to show up in opportunities. It isn't just a, a Sunday morning service. We also do services during the week, uh, mornings, afternoons, evenings. We'd be welcome to have you um, come join us and just sit in on a service and see and experience the ministry firsthand and uh, see if God is stirring your heart toward that. What an awesome ministry that we have here at Christ the Rock. And if you want to find out more information about how you can get involved in Shepherd's Care, how you can uh, volunteer to be part of that, as they, as they said right in the video, an opportunity for even just to go and check it out. There's a table out in the lobby. Uh, Shepherd's Care Ministry is out there. Rich and some of their crew is there. And they'd love to meet with you, to chat with you, uh, to just tell you a little bit more about how you can get involved, how you could be praying for them in that ministry that really ministers to often those who are most forgotten, those who can't be with us here. And I just want to let you know that if you and online in the next couple days, you're going to see some stories that are shared from that ministry. Uh, life change that has happened because of the work that Shepherd's Care is doing for those folks that are in residency there. Uh, people even coming to know Jesus for the first time. And so it's an amazing ministry I encourage you to be part of. If you're online, I want to let you know if you go to ChristTheRock.org forward slash connect, there's ways you can find out more about Shepherd's Care and any other ministries that we have for you to be like, like be part of. And I want to thank all of you because those, these ministries like Shepherd's Care can only happen because of the generosity of this church. It's living and giving generously, not just with our resource or with our money, but with our resources and our time and our talents. Uh, like we saw there in the video, those folks, they're going, they're making a difference in a mission field right in their own backyard. And that's because of the generosity of their hearts, the overflow of what Christ has done for them. And so I want to thank you, Christ the Rock, for living and giving generously and remind you that uh, the mission depends on that on us being Christ to the world around us. And so there are ways that you can give both financially and through your resources. Encourage you, let the Holy Spirit speak to you how you could give generously to not only the ministries here at Christ the Rock, but to the world around you. Well, let's pray together for our offering. Let's pray that God would take that and use it to further his kingdom, that even more would come to know him and pray for our message time as we get going in that. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for all that you are, for who you are and all that you've done. God, I thank you for the Shepherd's Care Ministry, the hearts of those who start that and partner with churches from around the Fox Valley to minister to those folks. Lord, I pray blessings on them. I ask that those of us who are hearing this right now, maybe the Holy Spirit, Lord, maybe you're speaking to us and prodding us to go find out more, to serve in that ministry. God, I ask that we would listen to that voice, that still small voice, that we would find out how we can give generously out of our lives to those folks. God, we thank you for all that you're doing here at Christ the Rock. We thank you for this time that we're about to enter in of hearing your word. God, I pray our spirits would be open to hear from you, that we would be challenged, but we would leave here changed. God, we ask all this in your name. And the church together said, amen.
So last Sunday, I had a conversation with someone after services that has stuck with me all week because they said, look, I'm trying to figure out this whole come together thing and reconcile with people, but I'm finding that as I reach out to family members and try to reconcile with them that there's some who just won't even talk to me. So what am I supposed to do about that? Am I supposed to keep pursuing them or should I just leave it be? Like, what, what's, the, what's the plan here? That's a great question. Because we are in this Come Together series, and this series is all about how we can overcome differences so we can discover unity with one another. But I will tell you that in family relationships, these might be some of the hardest relationships to find this in. Because with uh, church relationships or work relationships or people in your neighborhood, you can kind of compartmentalize, right? Uh, whereas with your family, it gets a lot messier. It gets a lot more complicated. And uh, 2020 did not help at all. If anything, many people have found deeper divisions and more dysfunction in their family because of the things that they disagreed about in the last 12 to 18 months. So it's not gotten easier for us. What are we supposed to do if we have a family member who is constantly negative or a family member who just simply won't talk to us? What about a family member who's constantly combative or maybe a family member who just wants to pretend like everything is fine when, when it isn't. What are we supposed to do? Well, I believe that the Bible actually gives us answers as to how we can enter into that family dysfunction and, and find a way that we can handle that. And it reminds me of the story of a man named Joseph. Now, maybe you've seen uh, this, the show Joseph in the Technicolor Dreamcoat. That might give you an idea of who he is. Or maybe you even watch The Ballad of Little Joe, uh, VeggieTales classic. And for some of you, that's your jam. And uh, so you might know the story of Joseph. But in case you don't know the story of Joseph, I want to I bring you through some of the highlights of his story and help us to understand, honestly, one of the most dysfunctional families you are ever going to hear about. And so in Genesis 37... It tells us this. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons. Israel is also known as Jacob in the Bible because he had been born to him in his old age and he made this ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him, hated Joseph and could not speak a kind word to him. And so they, they hated Joseph. You can already see the dysfunction at work here. You know, his father's favoring him, and the brothers are hating him for it. And Joseph, instead of trying to make this better with his brothers, he makes it worse. Because he starts to have these dreams. And in these dreams, essentially what happens is his brothers and even his parents are bowing down before him. Like, they bow down to him. So you know what he decides to do? He decides to tell them about it. He's like, hey, everybody, guess what? I'm having these dreams lately where you all bow down to me. And they're like, are you kidding me? Like, do you think that we are somehow, like, you're going to rule over us? Like, who do you think you are? And so they get, they, they hate him even more. They get more frustrated with him. And truth, truth be told, maybe you have somebody like that in your own family. Maybe you have somebody who, like, they're more favored for whatever reason, and it just drives you crazy. Like, it doesn't even make sense. Or maybe, maybe you have someone in your family who's a little bit like Joseph, and uh, they, they can't keep thoughts in their head. They just have to say them out loud. And they just say whatever's in their mind, and you're like, look, just because it's in here doesn't mean you have to share it in the atmosphere with all of us out here. Sometimes it's okay to just keep that in. And, uh, or maybe, maybe you have a family member who just causes a lot of division with the things that they say and the things that they do. Maybe there's a pride and an arrogance to the way that they handle things. And maybe sometimes you're, you're that person. But in this circumstance, Joseph was that person to his brothers, and they hated him for it. And so they, they decided one day that they're actually going to kill him. And so they, they, they're in the desert with him and they find this cistern. This is kind of like a giant well type thing. And they, they throw him into it. But there's no water in it. So it's just this empty cistern. They chuck him in. And the idea is just leave him there and let him die. But then they see a band of slave traders passing by. And they, wait, they say, wait, what does it profit us to just let him die out here like this when we can sell him into slavery and uh, we'll still never see him again, but we'll all make a little money. And so they go and they get Joseph out of the cistern. And you got to imagine at this point, he's going, okay, good. You guys came to your senses. You're not going to kill me. And then they're like, no, we're not. But guess what? And they sell him into slavery. And now he's off to Egypt. So I'll just say 
that if your family has never tried to throw you into a well and then tried to sell you into slavery, like there's still room for more dysfunction in your family to get to the level of Joseph's family. And, uh, but truth be told, truth be told that we all have dysfunction in our families. If you are a human and you're in a family, you have dysfunction in that family. It is part of the human condition. It, it, the, God, the, the family was God's design, and it's one of the places that the enemy attacks the most. And so we, we see that there's dysfunction in every family. Now, maybe the divisions in your family aren't as extreme as we see in the story of Joseph, but they might still exist. Maybe you do feel estranged from certain family members. Maybe there's certain people you're just not even sure how to talk to anymore. Maybe things have been said that you're not sure how to come back from. Or maybe there's family members that are just set on ignoring the reality. They won't deal with the problem and they just want to pretend like everything's just fine. Or maybe you do have family members that all you do is fight when you're around them. I mean, and maybe anything and everything in between. That we have these family dysfunctions and we're not always sure what to do about them. And so what do we do? What do we do when a family member is the one who hurts us? Because sometimes your family can hurt you worse than anybody. Because these are the people that we'll give our trust to, and then when they hurt us, it hurts even more. I've told you, this story, I've told you my story from this pulpit before, but there's multiple times where I've been hurt by family members. But when I was a junior in high school and we were evicted from our house, both of my parents told me that they weren't going to be able to take care of me anymore. And they just left me on my own. I just remember the the disillusionment, the frustration, the pain that came with a family member hurting me in that way. And it's deep when that happens. It's, you, you don't just bounce back from that. So what do, you, what do you do when family members hurt you in a deep way like that? When you give them that trust and they, they return it with, with pain? Well, the, the natural reaction is that we want to do maybe one of two things. We either want to get revenge on them and say, fine, then I'm going to try to find a way to get, get you back. Or what we might do is we might build up walls around ourselves and say, look, I'm never going to let this happen to me again. But here's the thing that starts to happen. The habits that we form in our family relationships often find their way into the other relationships in our life. And so if you have a hard time trusting your family, well, it's, it's likely that you're going to have a hard time trusting anybody. And so before you know it, you're actually building up walls between yourself and anyone because you don't want anyone to hurt you like that. This is where psychologists talk about issues that stem from our family of origin and we, we have to pay attention to that dysfunction that might rise in our own life because of the things that have been done to us in our family relationships. And so this is, this is huge. We have to look at this and say, how do we handle this? And so I want to look at the life of Joseph and see a few things that we can learn by the way that he handled his dysfunction and his own family's dysfunction. But first, I have to give you a little bit of a synopsis of what happened to Joseph once he arrived in Egypt. So once he gets to Egypt, uh, he begins to work for a man named Potiphar. Now, Potiphar is a really important guy in the royal uh, household, and so he, he's a pretty important dude in Egypt. And so Joseph begins to work for him, and then the Bible tells us that Joseph prospered in Potiphar's house, that he was promoted because the Lord was with him. And so Potiphar puts him in charge of his entire household. Then what happens is uh, Potiphar's wife gets the feels for Joseph. Like, apparently he was a pretty good-looking dude, and she noticed. So she makes a pass at him, and he, he responds by running out of the room. Literally. He's like, nope, see ya. And uh, I'm sure that she was hurt. I'm sure she felt embarrassed. And so what she does is she accuses him of trying to assault her. And it's his word against hers. And he goes to prison. So Joseph goes to prison. And then while he's in prison, he becomes the uh, kind of resident dream interpreter. And uh, when people have a dream, they bring it to Joseph. They say, what does this mean? And he'll tell them because God gave him this ability to do that. Well, there was uh, one guy that he interpreted a dream for, and that guy went on to work for Pharaoh himself. And then a couple years later, Pharaoh started having these really troubling dreams, and he said, does anybody know someone who can interpret dreams? And this guy, this cupbearer, he had told Joseph that he'd remember him. And it took him until two years later that he goes, oh, wait, Pharaoh, I, 
I got a guy. Do you ever have somebody like that in your life who anything you say, they're like, hey, I got a guy. Got a guy for that. Well, this cupbearer says, Pharaoh, I've got a guy, and he's really good at interpreting dreams, and so I, I, wanna, I want you to bring him here. And so Pharaoh, he brings Joseph to the palace, and he says, interpret this dream for me. And Joseph says, well, actually, God's going to interpret it, and I'm just going to tell you what he says. And so Pharaoh tells him the dreams, and then Joseph interprets those dreams for Pharaoh. And he says, the meaning of your dreams is that there's going to be seven years of plenty in the land of Egypt, followed by seven years of famine that's going to spread around the world. And so you need to take that seven years of plenty and get prepared for the seven years of famine. And there's something in Pharaoh that believes that that is the correct interpreta interpretation of the dreams. And so he, he looks at Joseph and he says, look, because God has given you this insight and wisdom, I want to put you in charge of all of the affairs of Egypt so that we can be prepared for the famine. And so Joseph actually gets promoted by Pharaoh to really the, the second highest position in the land. Only, only Pharaoh is more powerful than Joseph. He becomes essentially the prime minister of Egypt. This is what the Lord does in Joseph's life. He elevates him to this place. And it's important that we understand this context because then what happens next is even more incredible. So famine does strike the land seven years later. And uh, it, it spreads all over and it gets to Joseph's homeland. And so his brothers are affected by this famine. And so they, they go to Egypt so they can buy some grain and bring it home. So they're in this line in Egypt to buy some grain and Joseph recognizes it's his brothers. They're right there. But they don't recognize Joseph. They don't even know it's him. And so they come and they bow before him. I mean, can you imagine this moment? His dream is being fulfilled right there. And they don't even know it's him. I don't know if you ever uh, know about the story of the Count of Monte Cristo. But this is, this is one of those moments where they don't know it's him and he can completely take ultimate revenge over them in this moment. I mean, he could decimate them. They're at his mercy. He has all the power in the situation. But how does Joseph respond? What does he do in this moment? Well, there's a bunch of complicated stuff that happens for multiple chapters throughout Genesis. But it all culminates in this moment where Joseph finally decides to reveal himself to his brothers and let them know who he is. And I want you to see how this all goes down. And so in Genesis 45, it says, Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. So they did. And when they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. you got to imagine how wide their eyes got in that moment. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there's been famine in the land, and for the next five years, there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household and ruler of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me lord of all Egypt Come down to me, don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me. You, your children, and your grandchildren, your flocks and herds, and all that you have. This is a powerful, powerful moment. See, in this moment, Joseph has the opportunity for revenge. But what he does instead is he takes a different route. He forgives them. He actually absolves them of what they've done. And he says, God's actually the one who is at work here. He shows them grace. And then he says, go get dad and bring him back. See, their, their father believed Joseph was dead. And so they said, go tell him that I said, come down here and live. Live in the lap of luxury. Live in the safest place in the world at this moment. That God has put me ruler over. And come and, and be here and live in peace. So he extends the olive branch. He says, come and be here. What an incredible way for him to respond. Now, I think there's many things that we can learn from the story of Joseph, but there's one major point that I want all of us to grab a hold of when it comes to how we can deal with dysfunctional relationships in our own family. 
and it's this. Don't fall to the level of their dysfunction. Rise to the level of your calling. I'm going to say that one more time. Don't fall to the level of their dysfunction. Rise to the level of your calling. See, there are certain family members that when we get around them, the dysfunction just comes right up to the surface, doesn't it? Certain family members, you get around them and it's just like all the unhealth comes back and you, you can sometimes almost act like a different person around them. What we have to do is we have to fight the urge of getting into the boxing ring with those family members. And instead, we have to use those moments to remember our calling. What's our calling? Jesus said, come, follow me. We, we follow Christ. In Ephesians, it says that we ought to live lives worthy of the calling that we have received this calling of following Jesus and being like him, being transformed by him, being committed to the mission of Jesus. That is our calling as Christ followers. And so we, we, are to, we are to live out that calling even in the most dysfunctional relationships that we have, even with those in our family. So instead of falling to the level of that dysfunction, which we probably grew up with, it's so easy to fall into it. We have to rise to the level of our calling. But how do we do that? I, I want to share three practical ways that I think we can live out that calling, especially in regards to dysfunctional family relationships, the divisions that can exist in our own families. Number one is make peace your goal. That's number one, make peace your goal. Hebrews 12 says, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. And then Romans 12 says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, Live at peace with everyone. So you look at those two verses and it's telling us, as far as it depends on you, make every effort to be at peace with everyone. What this means is that for the Christ follower, you should never be the cause of division in your family. Christ himself will even sometimes bring division to families, but as the Christ follower, you are called to peace. So division might exist in your family, but it shouldn't be because of you. It, it might be because of other family members who refuse to reconcile. But the Christ follower is always going to work towards peace. So sometimes people ask me, as I said earlier, when do I just give up? When do I just say, you know what, I'm done with you, I'm sick of it? Well, did you make every effort? Did you do anything and everything you could think of? Anything the Holy Spirit might call you to do to make peace with everyone in your family. And if you have, then you can live at peace because you've done your part. You've done your part. That's all you're called to do, to do your part, which is to make peace with everyone. Now, some people, they hear that and they say, I feel like what you're telling me then is to be a doormat. Just let everybody walk all over me. That's actually the opposite of what it is. It takes incredible strength and resilience and courage to be able to do this, especially with your family. It takes incredible strength. Where do we get that kind of strength? Well, let's look at point number two. Trust that God has a purpose for the pain. We have to trust that God has a purpose for the pain. See, Joseph, he had to have developed a very deep and personal relationship with God. And we can tell this by a couple of things. One is this ability that he had to interpret dreams because he himself says it comes from God and God alone. And so the fact that he could interpret these dreams and that they were correct was a prophetic gift from God himself. But even more important than that, it's the way we see Joseph respond to his brothers. These people who had hurt him so deeply and yet he responds with so much character that he doesn't fall to the level of their dysfunction, but he rises to the level of their calling. But, but how? How does he do it? Well, I, I want to bring you to this place where he makes an incredible declaration. Because see, they, they're afraid of him. They're like, what is going to happen to us? And so his brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. 
So then don't be afraid. I'll provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. And so yet again, he reassures them. Yet again, he speaks kindly to them. And he lets them know it's okay. Why? Because Joseph's focus was not on what his family had done to him. His focus was on the Lord. And he said, what you intended for my harm, God has used for good for the saving of many lives. And that includes the the saving of all the people in the region that came to Egypt so that they could buy grain. But also through this is how God preserved the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob so that someday a Messiah could be born into this world. This purpose that God had was way bigger than Joseph or his brothers or their dad could even wrap their mind around. But Joseph, at least in the limited wisdom that he did have, he knew that God was using this for his purposes. So we have to trust that God has a pain for our purpose, that even when our family hurts us and intends to harm us, that God has a purpose for that pain. I look back at my own life and I see this to be so true. That there are moments where there's family who intended to hurt me. Sometimes it was unintentional, but sometimes it was. It was willful. It was intentional what they did. They didn't, they didn't live out the responsibility that they had as family members. But I look back at that and I can see this truth in my life. That God used what they intended for harm for good. For saving of many lives. Because my story has been able to be used that way and yours can too. But not only was it good for other people, it was also good for Joseph, what God did. Because it was probably one of the best things for him to be away from his family in the way that he was. I mean, he was elevated to such an incredible position, was used so powerfully by God. And so we have to trust that not only will it be good for those that we allow God to work through us to affect them, it's also going to be good for us. We have to trust him with that. We have to trust him with that pain as an act of worship and obedience. So we can either choose the pathway of trust or we can choose the pathway of revenge, which is the opposite of trusting God. It's taking it into our own hands. So what do we do when we get the opportunity to try to exact revenge upon our own family? Well, the Bible gives us really clear instruction. In Romans 12, it says, Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, It is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. So we have to trust God with that situation. If we try to take it into our own hands, we're not leaving room for God to do his job. He's not calling you to do his job. He's not calling you to be the one who convicts your family. He's not calling you to be the one who changes these family members. He's just calling you to do your part. God will always do his part, and it's up to your family member whether they they will do their part. So all you're called to do is your part in this. And it says leave room for God's wrath. Sometimes there's, there's ways that we can allow God to build healthy distance between us and other family members. There's some people that they actually take so much responsibility of trying to repair or change family members that they actually don't recognize sometimes those boundaries and that space can be a healthy thing. But God himself can put those things in place as he did in the life of Joseph. So we leave room for his wrath. We don't try to avenge. We let God do his part. God will do what he needs to do in the situation. We just have to trust him with that. I have to do this on a regular basis. Because there's times where I'll even remember things that happened a long time ago that I'd kind of forgotten about. And I get all angry all over again. And then sometimes I literally have to say, God, I give this anger over to you. I give this situation over to you. And not only that, I give this family member over to you. I'll, I'll name them out loud and I say, I give them to you, Lord. I pray that you would have your way in their life and show me what I can do in the situation to glorify you. I'll literally pray those prayers because if I don't, it will fester. And it will start to take a root that I don't want to see happen in my life. And so we have to trust God with the situations. For it says in 1 Peter 3, 9, Don't repay evil for good. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. That is what God has called you to do, and he will grant you his blessing. That's what he called you to do, and he will grant you his blessing. This is part of our calling 
to be like Christ and answer curses with blessing, trusting that God will then bless us as we do it with who he is in our lives. Point number three is own your part in the problem. Now this is, this is the one that maybe we don't always like as much. Because I'll tell you what, those first two, the first two that I just shared with you, they're hard. They're really hard to trust God with the pain that he has a purpose for it. And then to make peace, to be the one who works towards peace. These are hard things to do. But you, you kind of come out looking like the virtuous one in those situations. You, it's like, wow, okay, you're the one working towards the peace. You're the one trusting God. But when we have to own our part in the problem, that's a little bit more difficult. This is where we have to mix our conviction with humility. See, this is something that Joseph didn't understand as a young man. Because understand, what he told his family was true. He spoke the truth to them, but he did it with pride and arrogance. And it deepened the divisions in his family. And I'm sure that all that time in prison, the Lord was showing Joseph his pride and his arrogance. And clearly, he humbled himself before the Lord. You can see that by the way that he responded to his brothers with compassion and grace and humility. And so we, we have to own our part in the problem. How have we helped the division in our family get deeper? How have we contributed to the dysfunction in our family? Now, I want to make a note here. I'm not talking about when family members have egregiously hurt you or there's cycles of abuse that, that, that's something that's being done to you. And I'm not asking you to, in some kind of an unhealthy way, try to figure out how you contributed to that abuse. That's not what I'm talking about. That's, that's a whole different matter. And that's something that we have to allow the Lord to speak to us in. But what I'm talking about is how have you, in general, contributed to the dysfunction in your family? All of us can look at times where, sure, we've been hurt. But there's also times where we have decided to hurt others. There's been times where we've said things that we can't take back. There's been times where we've done something that we knew it was the wrong thing to do and we did it anyways. So what are we supposed to do when we, when we look at that? Because it's moments like this that we have to recognize that we cannot change our family, but we can allow God to change us. So how do we do that? Well, the Bible gives us a really clear practice, this, this heavenly mechanism that the Bible calls repentance. And in Acts chapter 3, verse 19, it says, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Repentance. This is what the Bible gives us so that we can experience the refreshing of the Lord in our lives. And repentance simply means to turn away from our sinful patterns, from our selfish ways, and to embrace the way of Jesus instead. It's the epitome of not falling to the level of the dysfunction of others. That if they want to be dysfunctional, okay, but I, I want to rise to the level of my calling. I want to let the Lord exalt me as I humble myself before him. That's what repentance is. And the Bible gives us this incredible promise that when we repent, there's times of refreshing that come directly from God himself in our lives. And not only that, but then it says he'll send the Messiah. If you want to experience more of Jesus in your life, you've got to have a lifestyle practice of repentance. It's what the Bible tells us. And so when we recognize these things that we've done, we have to repent. Now, for some of you, you might say, I've actually never repented. That this is the first time hearing of this. Never heard about repenting before. And maybe this would be the first time you would ever repent in your life. And if that's true, you can actually use this opportunity to enter into the kingdom of God through repentance and faith. The Bible says that we have to turn away from our sin and embrace Jesus. And when we do, that's the beginning of something brand new. That the Bible says that Jesus, he's the mediator of the greatest union that has ever been accomplished in the history of humanity. That it was Jesus and only Jesus. 
that bridged the gap that existed between us and God. And so that our sin no longer is the thing that holds us back from God, but instead he's removed our sin. He paid the penalty for us so that now we can have union and unity with God himself. This is incredible news. It's the best news ever told. And so if you're saying, I don't know how to be right with God. I don't know how to have a relationship with God. It's through Jesus. That is how it is. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so we give up this life that we think we have to embrace the eternal life that Jesus has for us. The Bible says if you simply put your faith and trust in Jesus, that you will have eternal life in him and you'll be saved. And so that's what repentance is. If you've never repented before, you can do that today. But I think for many of us who are listening to this right now, we, we have repented. But repentance isn't a one-time thing. It's a, it's a practice of a follower of Christ. Because here's the thing. The closer we get to Jesus, the more we should be repenting. Because the closer I get to his light, the more that I see things in myself that don't line up with who he is. And so I repent more and more and more. The more I get to know him, the more I understand why Paul said he was the chief of sinners. Because we start to see our own sin. Instead of trying to point out the speck of dust in our brother's eye, we notice the plank of wood hanging out of our own. And we repent more. But here's the good thing. That means more refreshing from the Lord. That means more of Jesus in my life. The more I repent, the more I experience of who God is. And so this is our calling. That we don't fall to the level of their dysfunction, but we rise to the level of our calling in Christ. So I want us to take a moment to reflect and just think, what might the Holy Spirit be calling you to do today? So in these three areas, which do you think that you need to respond to the most today? Is it to make peace your goal? Are you the one causing the division in your family right now? And if so, what would it look like for you to pursue peace instead? What would change in the situation? Maybe the Holy Spirit's saying, you're the one who's causing this division. It's time for you to make peace your goal. Maybe it's number two, that you trust that God has a purpose for the pain. Ah, oh, this one's so hard because sometimes that pain feels more real than anything else. But some of us, we, we allow ourselves to get bitter instead of allowing God to make us better. So what if you were to trust him with the pain and believe that he has a purpose? For some of you, I believe that's the place you need to lean into. And I don't think that God is looking at you so that you can feel shame. I think he sees the hurt. He sees how difficult it is. He knows what's been done to you, but he's saying, I wanna free you from that. I want you to live a different kind of life. So would you trust me with the pain and believe that I've got a purpose for every single thing in your life and you'll never be able to wrap your mind around it, but someday you'll look back and see all that I've done and it'll give you hope for the future as well. Or maybe for some of you, it's to own your part in the problem that you're starting to say, yeah, I, I see where I'm contributing to the dysfunction of my own family. I know that there's times that I have been one who's moving that forward and I need to own my part. I can't just always be the victim here. Sometimes I have to recognize where I have been the one who needs to apologize, who needs to be the one who owns up to what they've done. And so maybe that's where you're at today. Truth be told, all three of these things are things that we need to live out in our lives if we are going to live lives worthy of the calling we've received in Christ. But, but maybe the Holy Spirit is really highlighting one of these things to you. And he's saying, for right now in this season, you really need to lean into that and just trust me with it. Let me lead you in that. And I would encourage you with this. See, I'm, I'm just a person. But the Holy Spirit, if he is speaking to you to do something, even if it's something really, really specific, do it. Obey him. There is so much incredible life that happens when we obey what the Holy Spirit is prompting us to do. And so, so don't just take it from me. Spend time and listen to the Holy Spirit. And if he tells you to do something, I encourage you to do it immediately. 
because we're not promised tomorrow. And so sometimes we have to listen to what he's saying. We have to follow that conviction and realize it's good and that we listen to him. And if we're like, I don't know what to say, I'm not sure how it's gonna work, well, he'll give you the words to say. If you're a Christ follower, that's true. And he will give you guidance and he'll also comfort you when things maybe don't go the way that you hope they would. And so listen to the Holy Spirit today. And what I wanna do in that, in that spirit of letting the Holy Spirit work in our lives is I want us to pray a unifying prayer together as a church family. Now this is a pre-written prayer and sometimes those can feel ritualistic or rote, but there's sometimes just so much power in us together as God's people declaring something out loud in unity and believing upon the power of Jesus and the power of Holy Spirit working in our lives that that can come true because the Bible tells us it will. And so I wanna pray this together. And so you can look at the screen and let's pray this together. Loving Father, you have reconciled us in Christ Jesus and have given us the ministry of reconciliation. We pray for all those from whom we are estranged. Bring healing to strained or broken relationships. Forgive us for the times we have wronged others, whether by ignorance, neglect, or intention. Grant us the courage and the grace to seek their forgiveness and opportunity to make amends. Where others have wronged us, grant us a gracious spirit that we might forgive even as we have been forgiven in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Those are simple words, uh, but they're so hard to do in that prayer. And um, so that's uh, my personal prayer for me this week and for all of you too, is that we would be able to really listen for the Holy Spirit and think about those um, three points of Pastor Ben today, to trust uh, God, that there's purpose in the pain, to be a peacemaker in our own family relationships, and um, just to do our own part in looking inside and knowing where we're wrong. So um, I know probably all of us will have one of those that's more challenging than the others and um, let's just lift our, ourselves and, and each other up in prayer this week as we really examine our hearts for that and ask God to change us. Thank you so much for being with us today and we can't wait to have you back next week for our guest speaker Bob Lenz who's going to finish out this series for us next Sunday. So I look forward to seeing you then. Thank you so much for being with us today.